prime time local news serving the Lakeland and Midwest regions. Good evening, welcome to Primetime Local News. I'm Jasmine King. There are five new cases of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan with two in the south, one in the Saskatoon region, one in the far north, and one in the central region. Five people are in hospital, two in the north receiving inpatient care, and two in Saskatoon, and one person in intensive care in Saskatoon. The provincial total now sits at 813 with 48 cases considered active and 750 have recovered. The Saskatchewan budget for 2021 focuses on the economy, health care and the people of the province. Connor Chan has more on what the budget will mean for Saskatchewan. Once again, I'm joined with Colleen Young, the MLA for Lloyd Minster. So Colleen, thanks a lot for joining me once again. You're welcome, Connor. I'm glad to be here. So recently the budget was announced last month. So what can Saskatchewan residents see when it comes to the budget? I know the focus was on people and jobs and the economy. So just give us a little insight as to what residents in Saskatchewan can expect? Well, you know, as as we've opened up and re, uh, more and more of the economy during this pandemic and uh, relieved some of the restrictions on businesses, uh, we expect to see, you know, the people of this province reinvesting and, you know, regrowing our economic uh, fiscal ability in this province. So I think, you know, we trust uh, you know, the people of Saskatchewan will help us get back to balance. It might take a few more years. Let's remember, um, prior to COVID, we would have had a, a balanced budget with a, a small um, uh, amount of revenue, uh, you know, in the hold going forward. But the pandemic, you know, hit and we've had to support uh, businesses and people in this province who were unable to work, even though we, we as a province, uh, kept 87% uh, of our economy was still functioning. Um, we were one of the few provinces that can that can state that, you know, once COVID hit, that we kept 87% of our economic uh, people working in this province. So, you know, but it will take time. It was a $2.4 billion hit to our budget. And, uh, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for us to get things going, but we're very confident in uh, the people of this province and those that uh, choose to invest in, and do business here in Saskatchewan. You mentioned about Saskatchewan being one of the few provinces having a pretty balanced economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you think is the one key thing that made Saskatchewan stand out in, that, in those regards? Well, I think just, you know, our trust in the people to do all the right things in order to support um, getting the, uh, you know, the, pa the virus and the curve flattened. And uh, we thank the people of this province for that. I mean, they were very good at following the restrictions and helping to keep that in check as well. So that allowed us to leave businesses operating and uh, continuing to function. And, uh, you know, we put our trust in the people of this province to all to do the right thing. And, and they most certainly did come through for us. So that gave us the province who was the first one to put forward a reopen plan. And so because of what the people were doing, we knew that we could do it and move forward. Now, of course, the one of the things that was mentioned was the money, a lot of money going towards the health care because of with all the COVID-19 pandemic that's been going on, a lot of money has been going back into that. So just take us on how that money is going to be allocated throughout the different cities in the province. Well, there is, you know, an additional amount uh, that has been committed to mental health and addictions in the province. And uh, as we know, that has been um, a key topic for, for many people on many people's minds, not just during this pandemic, but prior to that. I mean, as we all know, we have seen a rise in uh, drug use and abuse, and uh, that is something that is very much needed um, to find those supports that support people who are going through those kind of challenges in their lives. and. Our government is committed to continuing to support the mental health and addictions beds that we've had at the Slim Thorpe uh, Recovery Center. So funding will continue uh, there on that aspect of it. And there is some conversation going on as far as Lloyd Minster goes with support, more, supports for more mental health and addiction and recovery services that are being provided in our community. Now you mentioned Lloyd Minster. I know the focus, there's another focus on the budget with helping communities across the province. 
how do you think the budget will ultimately in the end help a city like Lloydminster? Well, I think that, you know, um, we've provided additional funding for schools. As you know, we've had an announcement in our, for education, another over $2 billion that came out of the 7.5 um, billion that was committed to infrastructure over the next two years. And uh, Lloyd Minster was a beneficiary of that with uh, both of our high schools, the, the Lloyd Comp getting 25 million of that and the Holy Rose were getting 10 million to add classrooms and uh, possibly gyms, whatever, you know, that's in their design um, to those facilities. So supporting our educational system here. We are going to see some additional dollars uh, through the Municipal Economic Expansion Program for shovel-ready projects that the city has probably had to put on hold over the last few years and now can move forward with the additional dollars that they will be getting through the MEET funding. So there are other uh, things out there that are coming forward for Lloyd Minster that uh, we can look forward to. And I know that there is also some conversation with uh, Saskatchewan Health Authority with regards to the renal dialysis unit being moved to the downtown location. Well, Colleen, I really appreciate your time as always joining me today. And thank you for giving us a little insight as what we could expect with the budget heading into the next year. So thank you. You're more than welcome, Connor. It was great to visit with you. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, it's going, this is an election year and we are going to be moving forward, but uh, the government, you know, has invested into the people of this province and we will continue to do that. And I hope that they will continue to support us. Now our Connor Chan will take a look at your weather forecast. All right, thanks very much, Jasmine. Take a look right now, much warmer day than yesterday. We're right now sitting at 20 degrees with the daytime high right now. A little bit of sun, starting to get a little bit more cloud coverage coming in though, but not as much wind compared to yesterday as well. So sitting at less than 10 kilometers per hour there. Take a look in Lloydminster right now, still 20 degrees. Vagerville, Vermilion, and Edmonton sitting at 22. St. Paul sitting at 22 as well. Cold Lake sitting at 22 as well. Macklin at 23. North Balfour sitting at 23 degrees. They've experienced lots and lots of rain over the course of the last several days, over 100 millimeters in that time. Time frame and 21 degrees out in St. Walberg, 22 for Meadow Lake, 19 out in Isle of Cross. So here's a look at the satellite radar map right now as of today. Not as intense as it was yesterday, but we do see some activity in that Edmonton, Vagerville area. We are expected a couple of days heading into this week with lots of showers expected, including on the weekend as well, which we'll showcase in just a little bit in the 70 forecast. We could see all that all that uh, cloud coverage and precipitation moving up from the southwest areas into the northern areas as well into our region, in, uh, which will follow suit and then for overnight North Battle for 12 degrees with some thunder showers tomorrow that rain's going to continue on there with that daytime high of 22 degrees cold lake overnight with some showers expected there 13 degrees the daytime high there and 21 degrees for tomorrow as their daytime high take a look for us here in Lloyd Minster we should to get the same results some rain overnight heading into 21 degrees tomorrow with the daytime high as well as some thunder showers to follow suit so here's a look at the next three days we will get a little bit of a break on Saturday with the daytime high there of 25 degrees and hot and a high of 20 on Sunday where showers could continue on. We could see maybe up to 10 millimeters of rain for that time frame there for there as well. But that's a first look at your weather forecast. We'll have more primetime local news after this. Welcome back. The Lloyd Exhibition is in full swing with the annual Lloyd X Fair for people to come down and enjoy the delicious foods. Shelby Clark has more. After decades of residents attending and participating in the Lloyd X Fair, this year is a bit different from the rest. I think people needed something to get out because they were tired of um, staying at home and doing nothing. So it's been, a, it's been encouraging for people that Lloyd uh, Exhibition was able to put something together in such a short time. Leela Phillips owns both of the food trucks here at the fair and are busy selling delicious foods to everybody stopping by. Uh, we have candy floss. We have a new product that we're just launching this year, and it's called Tiny Tim Apple Fries. And they're totally delicious. They're just like eating a hot apple pie. Uh, candy apples, popcorn, you name it, all your fair food, we've got it all. During this COVID-19 pandemic, the fair was a concern if the Lloyd Exhibition should have it at all this year due to safety regulations. 
Well, I think the biggest thing is social distancing and uh, people yesterday did really well in Lloyd Minister. We watched and made sure that people were staying their social distance. Lila has a new idea to help people in need during COVID-19 because she believes addiction can get worse when people are having to stay home. So what I'm doing with Tiny Tim now is I am raising money for two foundations. One, the one I'm working on right now is Travis's House, which is a rehab and it'll be located just outside of Edmonton. Although due to the circumstances, fairgoers are still happy and are enjoying the, everything the Lloyd X has to offer. I think obviously it's less busy than a regular fair, but it's nice that we have something happening and something for our community to do. The fair will continue taking place at the Lloyd X until July 11th with more activities for families to enjoy. For Primetime Local News, I'm Shelby Clark. Now here are your stock market prices for today. Today's oil prices are brought to you by First General Services. Welcome back. Heavy rain has left some farmers unable to seed their fields, with a large number of fields left empty, especially in the northern part of Alberta. Eric Bay reports. AFSC is seeing 325,000 acres unseeded across the province, with about 70% of fields accounted for. The Edmonton area has seen the worst of Mother Nature, with Lamont County already declaring a state of agriculture emergency. North of Edmonton, the counties surrounding Edmonton are seeing the most significant uh, uh, numbers of unseeded acres, and that extends into the southern uh, portion of the Peace region. Um, you know, Lloyd Minister is uh, kind of that area, St. Paul, etc. would follow in kind of behind that. The Northeast region, which includes Lloyd Minster, has 7,500 acres left unseeded, while other producers have standing water in their crops. It's very spotty. Um, there's, there's pockets that had un, a lot of moisture that have that is problematic and we're seeing a lot of drowned out areas, especially the lower lower lying ground and I so we uh, don't need any more uh, moisture for that. Tough conditions come with the territory and this year's tough weather is something Alberta's growers have come to expect over the past few years. Continual hardships from you know the excessive amounts of moisture uh, over the past few years unharvested acres uh, you know in 2019 that have carried over into uh, obviously in 2020 where producers were trying to harvest the, those crops in the spring and now continue faced with uh, excessive moisture. While AFSC's final number is expected to be much higher than the current total of 325,000 acres left unseeded in the province, it is not expected to reach the numbers seen in 2017 when over 600,000 acres were left unseeded. Eric Bay, Primetime Local News. Now we'll take a look at your egg prices. On this week's Around the AJHL, Evan Kenny chats with two-time North All-Star and current professional hockey player Brock Mashmeyer. Joining me today for another edition of Around the AJHL is former two-time AJHL All-Star and currently playing in the Danish Elite League Div 2 for the Hale Braun Falcon. 
Brock Mashmeyer. Brock, thanks for taking this time. You jumped into the league as a 16-year-old. That is the AJHL, uh, playing with the Lloydminster Bobcats. Why don't you just break down in your own words how your AJHL career started? Uh, well, for the first season, uh, I was playing midget hockey there, and I was a younger guy in that league. So, And uh, Tom Kekka was actually the coach of Lloyd Minster at the time. And he reached out to my parents who were like, what do you think if he comes out here at age, I think I just turned 16 the first day I drove out there, like probably just got my actual license and driving like a crazy person through Lloyd. And uh, yeah, Tom Kekka brought me out there, said, hey, uh, if you want to play, you got a spot here. And it was it was definitely a tough, tough thing for me, you know, at age 16, Leaving, leaving home and leaving everybody, all my friends behind. But then uh, the old man said, tough it out, and toughed it out, and ended up just absolutely loving it out there. Um, really couldn't complain, and that's kind of how it happened. And Lloyd, like, it was kind of a, uh, a situation where Tom Kekka came and talked to us personally, talked to me personally, and said, this is a great opportunity for you, and you could go play on pro and – and keep going from there. Now, Brock, in your final year with Fort McMurray, you were on the same decor as now Stanley Cup champion Colton Pareko. What was that like getting to see him develop and playing alongside him? You know what? Uh, we ended up being D partners for the first uh, the first year he came to the team, which would have been my second year there. Uh, or maybe it was my uh, – it might have been my first year there. And when I got traded there, we, we ended up playing D partners. We didn't get scored on for the first, I think it was like 12 or 13 games. So, like, we were putting up points, we were playing well, and couldn't complain. It was kind of interesting because uh, Cor Thibodeau was a coach at the time, and he's also coaching Lloyd as well. But he he saw this big D-man, Colton Preco, and this smaller D-man, D which is me, so 5'8". He's... What's Preco? Six five. Give it Anyways, to nicest nicest guy ever. But you see it; it's like this tower and this this smaller person playing together. And uh, honestly, it, it was it was a great experience. Like I can't complain about him. He he's a great guy and always has been. Brock, you have family ties to the game. Both of your sisters going through the NCAA. Your brother currently played on your team for the end of this. Pe- previous season and one of your sisters is even the goalie for team Canada how important was it for you growing up having your family being a part of the game honestly it's been all the way through um if you if you go to our home farm out in Bruderheim Alberta you'll see there used to be one bigger rink and then we switched it to a more skilled rink and you know we just had all the support and everybody was pushing each other uh, including my youngest brother, Cash, who's now a pilot, so he can't really complain either. But it's it's honestly been one one great ride, and that's going for everybody with NCAA, um, for myself and my two sisters, as well as CIS for my brother. Uh, you can't really complain. Everybody pushed each other from childhood all the way up, all the way up and through. And if, if somebody ever found a new way to do something, you know, the other the other family members are trying to do it too. So it was, it was a cool situation where we all kind of uh, grew together, I would say. And then finally, Brock, what was that jump up like from uh, college hockey to professional hockey? You know, um, after NCAA, it's funny because when you first go into NCAA, you're kind of this younger guy, smaller guy. And by the end of coming out of there, you're coming out a big boy, strong, ready to move people around. And then you get to pro, and pro you got guys anywhere from, well, you could have guys that are 18 all the way to, you know, 42. I I think the oldest guy I played with was last year, and he he was 40. And these guys are men, you know, some of them have kids and everything. And making that jump, it was uh, honestly... The better the leagues, the easier the hockey. That's how I feel. It's not as scrambly. It's more skilled. You know where people are going to be. You don't have to worry about that one person that you have no idea what he's doing on the ice. Everybody knows their role. 
and it's it's uh it's kind of like a mind switch where uh let's say bantam hockey it's scrambly midget hockey it's scrambly you get to the aj you get a little bit more structure and you get you just get different systems then you move to the ncaa where you get a ton of systems and the hardest work ethic ever um the ncaa with those cages on it's like everybody's going out as hard as they can because well, you're not afraid to get a puck to the face or an elbow or something. Yeah, it might get a little scruffy, but, you know, there's there, there's not really fights, right? And then you go from that to pro, and it changes from as work as hard as you can to work as smart as you can, so the structure of the game actually becomes even better. And I found that throughout my first year, and as you move through the years, you see how easier and easier it actually gets just because you know what these players are going to do. You know how the game is going to be played. Now, playing pro in Europe is a whole other thing where it's a, it's a skill game. You don't see a lot of fights and, you know, huge hits. Like, you might have one big hit a game, but that's it. Like, in my first year, uh, I think I probably got my bell rung once or twice, but uh, playing in the NCAA, you're getting hit every game at least five to ten times a game and hard you know like you're expecting it but in europe hockey it's it's more skill it's more puck skill and it's it's less go 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 more all right let's find the open guy we know what to do and find him you know find that goal scorer so changing from ncaa to pro it's just been it's been a great ride honestly it's it's nothing like how everybody talks about pro it's great it's honestly awesome i can't complain brock we appreciate you taking this time and chatting with us this was brock mashmeyer now we're connor chan we'll take a look at your weather All right, thanks very much, Jasmine. Taking a look at some temperatures right now. 21 degrees now. We sit here in Lloydminster, 22 out in uh, Athabasca, 21 in Edmonton, 13 degrees in Edson, 19 degrees for Red Deer, and 20 degrees out in Rocky Mountain House as well. 19 also for White Court right now. As move over into Saskatchewan right here, 22 degrees for Saskatoon and in North Battleford, 17 degrees out in Melford, 19 in Prince Albert, and 22 degrees out in Meadow Lake. Now, as we move into the northern areas of Alberta and Saskatchewan, 20 degrees for Buffalo and Arrows and Laloche there, 22 out in Flynn Flon, 17 for Walston Lake and in South End. Uranium City sitting at 19 degrees and Stony Rapids sitting at 18 right now. Northern Alberta seeing a little bit warmer, sitting at 24 degrees in Fort McMurray and high level, 22 in Fort Chippewa and Peace River and 16 degrees for both Slave Lake and in Grand Prairie. Now moving over into the southern Alberta, Saskatchewan areas, 23 degrees for both Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, 21 out in Coronation, 20 degrees up in Calgary and 16 degrees for Banff. And over in the southern Saskatchewan areas right now, pretty uh, they dropped down a little bit compared to the last couple of days. So 20 degrees in Regina and Swift Current, 19 degrees out in Estevan, 21 for Moose Jaw and in Kindersley and 22 degrees for Yorkton. Now as we take a look at the rest of the country, Regina sitting with some cloud coverage right now at that 20 degrees, 25 in Winnipeg with that cloud coverage, pretty much the same trend for most of the country. Uh, 30 degrees in Winnipeg, uh, Quebec City, excuse me, 33 degrees in uh, Toronto, 13 in St. John, 26 degrees in Halifax, a little bit warmer than St. John's with some sunshine there and 18 up north in Yellowknife and 17 up in Whitehorse and 20 degrees for Vancouver right now with some cloud coverage as well. Now, if you look at tomorrow's daytime highs, pretty much the same for most of our area here. 21 degrees, the common number we'll see here throughout the daytime there. 23 degrees out in Edmonton, as well as 22 down in Provost and in Macklin. And over in the Saskatchewan side, we will see about 22 degrees in North Battleford for tomorrow. 20 degrees in St. Walberg and 20 degrees also out in Green Lake with 19 degrees in Isle La Crosse. So here's a look at the next seven days as we are expecting some showers for the next seven days. As we take a look at tomorrow, a 60% chance of some showers there possible uh, thunderstorm may may on the suit as well uh, 25 degrees for Saturday as we get a little break from the rain we'll have more rain back again on Sunday with a daytime high of 20 degrees there Monday we sit at 17 degrees with a 15 percent chance of some showers with maybe up to five expected millimeters of rain 18 degrees on Tuesday 20 degrees on Wednesday where we could get some more rain as well and then 20 degrees on Thursday as well we could see maybe up to about one to three millimeters on both Friday and on Sunday we usually average around that 22 degrees for our daytime high this around this time of year and 
10 for our daytime low. That is a look at your seven day forecast. We'll have more primetime local news coming up after the break. I'm joined here with Serena Parsons and she is the executive director of the Bonneville Chamber of Commerce. Now, how has it been for the Chamber of Commerce adjusting to this pandemic? So like anything else, the Chamber of Commerce, um, we always advocate for our members on a daily basis. You know, that's our job. That's what we're here for. But during the COVID-19 crisis, of course, it became more pertinent than ever that we do everything we can. So it's been a very busy time for your Chambers of Commerce. And, um, you know, I don't think people see the value of a membership more than they have lately because it's been, uh, it's been a crazy time as it has been for many, many people. Um, we are an essential service. We were deemed that and, and we have been working tirelessly um, to help identify gaps in services and send that to the powers that be to make sure that all businesses have the resources they need to survive this. And how has it been for businesses in Bonneville during this time? Well, it's been a, it's been a real challenge. Um, so many were really scared and frightened about the ability to reopen after COVID-19. Um, the statistics showed that the majority of businesses didn't think they could sustain themselves past a three month closure. Um, required, of course, by the government. Um, luckily, we have been relaunching our economy and through the Chamber of Commerce here in Bonneville and our Chambers of Commerce, uh, our partners in Cold Lake and St. Paul, we have been working on a lot of regional initiatives to ensure that our businesses um, can come together and that we say, hey, you know what, it's, uh, it's time to get back to business. It's safe to do so. We're adhering to AHS guidelines, as are many, many of our businesses out there. Uh, nobody wants to put anybody in danger, but it's important that we do get back to work. So we have started a campaign called uh, hashtag let's go Lakeland. So let's go grocery shopping. Let's go out for lunch. Let's go support our local businesses and do everything we can. And you mentioned the initiatives. Is that one of like your main ones or is there a few others that these Chamber of Commerce are offering to really get the businesses and community involved? Well, Jasmine, it's important that we kind of um, discuss municipal chambers versus our provincial and federal chamber. Okay, so on a municipal level, many chambers of commerce have been doing their own thing. We are about to announce uh, and launch, actually this is the first time I've discussed this, uh, a grant program where we're going to sell t-shirts to our community that says our resiliency runs deep. We have deep roots here in the Lakelands. We have deep lakes. We've got our trees. And you know, we want to sell those. All the profits, 100% of the profits, will be going back into our business community to supply grants. So Chambers of Commerce members can apply for that grant and then they can get upwards of $500 to $1,000 to help assist them with their relaunch. So we're really happy that that is a chamber-led initiative. We also have a business resiliency committee where we're bringing members from the city of Cold Lake, the town of Bonneville Council, the MD of Bonneville Council, and of course our Chambers of Commerce and Community Futures to identify what we can do for businesses. Through that, we've done what we call the Lakeland Showcase. We advertise for businesses. We're saying it's okay. We call it a bit of an anti-fear campaign. It's okay to get back out there. It's okay to support local. And you know, that's what we're here for now. We need to get back to business and we're really happy to promote that. On a provincial level, um, I think it's very important to note that we have been sending surveys. So as a Chamber of Commerce, We've been sending many surveys to businesses to help identify gaps in services um, that we then use to inform the policymakers and the Premier's Economic Development Recovery Council um, to ensure that all the resources are inclusive of all businesses and that everyone has the support that they need. And that sounds awesome. And now for you and for maybe other Chamber of Commerce, has there been any financial aid programs that have been offered to businesses at this time? Well, there are many provincial as well as federal financial aid program. Of course, we know about the Canadian wage subsidy. Um, Alberta just launched their $5,000 relaunch grant. Of course, there's too many that we can discuss right now. But if any business has not fully applied or don't feel like that they've taken advantage of their, you know, of their government resources, give us a call. Call your local chambers of commerce. Call Community Futures. We will put you in touch with um, the information that you need. We'll help you with supports. We also have a voucher program. So a business can come to us and if they need professional support, whether it be human resources 
or a lawyer or an accountant, we will pay for an hour of service with that professional to help them navigate the very complicated world of government resources. So we're here to help. Now the Bonneville Chamber of Commerce hosts the Bonneville Oil and Gas Show. So with the pandemic, did that have to be put at a halt at all? Actually, Jasmine, we're really lucky that that event is every two years. So we did not have to cancel our oil and gas show this year, which we are extremely happy about. We are, though, proceeding with plans for the 2021 Bonneville uh, Oil and Gas Show because we think it's important to get back to business. Alberta is very unique during this economic crisis right now. It's not just COVID-19. We have been experiencing uh, you know, a loss of business and revenue because of the oil price crisis. So we've got two crises that we're, bat that we're battling right now. And as a Chamber of Commerce, we need to identify both of those. 2021 comes back on, we're planning our Bonneville Oil and Gas Show, and we're really happy to say, hey, we're back to business and we're gonna do everything we can because we can't, the Canadian economy needs our oil and we're gonna help do what we can to promote that. And is there any other future plans for the Chamber of Commerce at this time? we are constantly doing what we can. So of course, one thing we're really excited about, um, besides boosting our economy and trying to get businesses back into that secure place where they're positive and happy for the future, um, as a Chamber of Commerce, we are looking forward to getting back to offering those networking uh, things that we do, to offering more webinars, uh, courses, and things like that that we offer to our businesses um, that seem to be more of a day-to-day -day need. Right now, of course, we've been um, clouded by our current economic reality and doing what we can to get through that. But we're really happy. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel when we can start saying, hey, you know what? Now we can offer you guys the webinars and the training that you need for you and your employees um, to just do day-to-day -day work again. And if anyone is looking to contact you in the Chamber of Commerce, how can they do so? Well, of course, for us, um, if you contact your local chamber, there's all websites, bonnievillechamber.com or you can call us at 780-826-3252 and we will be happy to help you or put you in touch with whatever resource you may need. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Serena. Thanks, Jasmine. Furniture Set and Design supplied by Furniture Gallery and Furniture House, downtown Lloydminster. Ryan LeBlanc joins me today from the Lloydminster Rescue Squad. Now, uh, there are many strong currents in Saskatchewan rivers and lakes, so we're just talking a little bit about what are some tips for people to make sure that they're safe when they're around lakes and rivers in Saskatchewan? Yeah, you bet. So I guess the most important thing to, to remember is anytime you are around a body of water, whether it be a lake or a river, or even on the beach, um, you know, if kids are playing near water, it's always best to have a life jacket or some kind of personal flotation device. You know, uh, all too much you see kids playing on the beach, going into the water and uh, not really knowing how to swim. So it's it's something we strongly recommend to always have a, a personal flotation device. Um, yeah, on you or, or, or you know, um, uh, wearing it or, or around you. And especially because when people swim in a, a pool, it's a lot different than when they're in a lake or a river, the currents are a lot different. Um, so just talking a little bit about uh, when the rescue squad is helping doing a rescue and a lot of people in the community might be concerned or wanting to help out, what are ways people can uh, help the rescue squad or is it, what can people do when they're, you guys are doing the rescue? Yeah, so again, I think uh, um, um, if people are going out in the in the water to make sure um, they check the the currents, check with the local residents, uh, what kind of what are the currents doing, um, you know, or check the Alberta websites, Saskatchewan websites to see what the rivers are doing. I know over the last couple of weeks they've uh, they've substantially increased in speed and and uh, and height. So um, you know that's one thing they'll look for or look 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 at when you're going in to be swimming in the rivers and lakes. Um, the other thing to look at too is um, um, when, when we are called to a, uh, a, a, a rescue or a recovery, um, the, 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 the outpour from the community is, you know, in the past has been amazing, uh, but sometimes it just be, gets a little overwhelming with the amount of people that do come out to help us. Um, you know, it could potentially cause a, a bigger issue than what we're trying to accomplish at that point. So um, if people are willing to lend a hand, uh, we just ask that they go through the proper channels to do so and not just, not just come out and uh, deploy themselves into the water. And what are those proper channels if someone's looking to help out? 
So, you know, uh, if, if there is a rescue, um, uh, typically a lot of the logistics are going to be handled through the RCMP. So, um, you know, they can give us a call or give the RCMP a call to uh, offer their assistance. At that time, then uh, if, if some is needed, then they'll be uh, directed as such. And when it comes to the rescues, when you're helping people that are maybe uh, trapped in water or stuck uh, in that kind of thing, what are the activities that they're doing that leads up to them needing the assistance? Yeah, so you know, sometimes they're they're floating down a river, um, having fun in in some tubes or blow up boats or even just regular boats, um, or they're out on kayaks or canoes. Uh, you know, um, it's it's always important that they check, like I said, the the currents, the water temperature is important because you know hypothermia is a factor in in even in the summer months when it gets cold. Um, you know, and the weather, uh, to check the weather, if you're going out on the kayaks or canoes, whether it be a lake or a river, just check that weather to make sure that you're not expecting any high winds or, or some heavy, heavy waves. And when it comes to people that are boating, uh, obviously wearing a life jacket is one of the big and most important steps. But what are some other things that people can do to make sure that they're uh, keeping safe uh, out on the water? Uh, you know what, uh, it's, it's always nice to have a cold beer out on the water, but again, stay away from the alcohol. If you're going to be operating a boat or uh, if you're going to be going in the river, um, stay away from the alcohol. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to have some drinks, then don't operate the, 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 the boat um, uh, out on the, on the lakes. Um, it gets pretty busy on some of the lakes that are around our community. So, you know, if you get a few boats out there, it, uh, things can happen rather quick. Perfect. Well, thanks for taking some time to talk to, with me today, Ryan, and uh, have a good rest of your day. You too. Thanks for talking. Take care. Thanks for joining us with, for Primetime Local News. Have a great night.